All right, okay, so let's get started. All right, so a brief recap of what we've been doing for the last uh, few lectures, right? So last few lectures, if you look at the power system, what we have is we have a generator, let's say one side, a transformer, a transmission line, another transformer, uh, not let's say then to some load. So last few lectures, what we've been doing is we are able to turn a transformer into a circuit, right? a normal circuit through the modeling and pre-unit analysis. Okay? And this works for both for three phase and uh, single phase. Okay? So our goal is better to turn well, this whole system into a circuit. Right? So we can make transformers into a circuit. This is, you know, per phase, basic, sorry, per unit. Analysis allows us to do this. And then today we're going to look at transmission line. Okay, we're going to look at transmission line. And the transmission line, the model will end up with, so a transmission line at the end of the day to us will be something like this. Right, so this is our transmission line. And uh, our goal is to somehow get to this point. Okay, so we're going to take a you know actual transmission line, you know, the cable is about this big, right? And then we're trying to reduce it to this circuit model that we have here. And the goal is to understand what physical characteristics impact the circuit model. And uh, want to you know understand where the values are, you know how large this R is, how large the L is, how large the C is, where those values come from. And in practice, what can we assume? Right? Can we assume something is small? Uh, do we have to model something else? This kind of question, right? So this is our goal. So the punchline of this uh, transmission modeling is a little bit underwhelming because it's, what will you do in practice? You open up a computer program, you type in some numbers, they'll spit out this RLC numbers for you. Okay, so will you ever calculate any, you know, actual quantities by yourself? Probably not. But still, you should, you know, we want to get enough idea of where these values come from. Okay. And turns out transmission line really modeling as a beautiful application of electromagnetic theory okay, is a really sort of a elegant, you know, application of how uh, Maxwell equations work. Okay, it's really beautiful for that theory, but I don't think all of you have seen that. Right? Just, just to check, uh, who have not seen EM theory? If you have not speak up, that will determine how fast we go. So nobody said anything, so I'm assuming you all know Maxwell's equations. You all know how to do passing intervals. We all know how to do. I, I do not, Professor. Right. Okay. Yeah. So what I thought is maybe not everybody has seen it. So we'll. So if you get confused, you know, somewhere when we're doing calculations, uh, that's fine. Uh, so you know, have not seen the theory. It's hard to, you know, teach that body of theory in a few lectures. But try to follow along and try to at least understand why the equations come out the way they do. Right? At the end of the day, you know, these are equations you can find in textbooks, you're punching numbers in the computer, things will come out. But it's a good idea to understand why things come out this way. Right? Okay? So that's that's the understanding we want to have. Okay? So that's the go for transmission line modeling. Okay? So we so you know, anytime during the class you think about why are we doing this as if you actually become a power system engineer and you drive you know on the highway you look at the transmission line you just have some idea right of what, you know, how much current is this line carrying what's the voltage level you know if this line goes out is it important to the system or not there's some sort of intuitive idea you want to have all right so transmission line so what does transmission line do well, transmission lines are really simple, right? In one, in one sense, they're simple objects. They're basically provide uh, a path. 
for power flow from one generator, from the generator to the low. Okay. Really, there's not much more to say in some sense beyond that. But well, they are not uh, they're not that simple to build or to model. Okay, so this is different when you talk about this high voltage, high power compared to let's say you're building a circuit on a breadboard. So there you don't think much about transmission lines. For you, they're just wires. For power system engineers, transmission line causes maybe the most headache for us. The world will be better. If the transmission lines are just wires that we put in, we don't have to think about it again, but that's not the case. Okay, if you actually, you know, person engineer and uh, you work on the transmission or distribution system, maybe more than 50% of your time is spending thinking about transmission lines. Okay, so why do you spend all that much thinking about transmission lines? Well, transmission lines turns out are notoriously hard to build. Okay? So if you look at the actual, actual cost, the material cost of a transmission line, it is in some sense trivial cost. Okay, so actual material cost is about $1,000 to $2,000 per mile, which is very low compared to any other infrastructure. Okay? And that's where it makes sense, just you know, metal, a bunch of, a bundle of metal wires. Okay? It doesn't cost all that much money. However, if you look at the total cost, so if you want a transmission line, if you want to build your own transmission line and the transmission line and uh, how much do you have to pay well the mice so this is the middle inter this is the mid inter uh, mid continent interconnection so think of you know wisconsin michigan this kind of area it's from 1.5 million dollars to three million dollars per mile of transmission this is per mile each mile think of costing around two million dollars Okay, so, you know, people, if you talk about, I give you $2 billion to build a transmission line, how long can you build a line? Not very long. Okay, not a very long line. Right, so what do you think causes the vast difference between the physical cost of buying material for the line versus the amount of money you have to pay to actually get a line built? If I have an idea, have some thoughts of why it costs, you know, why is the difference so drastic? Installation costs? No, that's not, that's more than the material cost, but that doesn't, that's not in the millions of dollars per mile. That's, labor is, is it hard. like the cost to repair the lines? No, that's still, no, it's not this large, not this large. Is it also? It comes out the climate because it's uh, so cold in the Michigan and uh, Wisconsin. Sorry, can, can you repeat that? Because it's very cold in the Michigan and the Wisconsin. So, so. Uh, no, so this is actually one of the lower numbers in the US. If you do this in California, this thing, you know, doubles or triples. Is it, is it due to damages that failed transmission lines create? Uh, some of it, right? So I think in chat, somebody said lawsuits, yes. So you have to pay lawyers when you want to pay a translation line because somebody will sue you. Okay, I'm guaranteeing somebody will sue you. But the main money, sort of the main cost of this is buying the land to build a transmission line. Okay. Nobody owns the land end to end of the transmission line. Okay, nobody owns, you know, two miles, sorry, 2,000 miles of land that's about you know, 10 meters wide, okay? We just don't own land like that. So invariably you pass through some land that's not you know, owned by the government or owned even by the you know, power companies or the system operators, right? So you have to buy land. You have to clear the land. You have to you know, move everything under the line out of the way. Right? That basically is very, very costly. Okay? So there's a right away, it's something that you may not think about from engineering perspectives, but this means, do I own the land under the transmission line or not? Okay. And this costs you a lot of money. Okay, try buying one mile of land and say, I'm gonna build a transmission line on top of it. Okay. So think about how much money that will cost. Right. And people don't like the way lines look, right? 
you can actually hear sometimes the transmission line. So there's two reasons. One is you have a big line and wind blows, so sort of, this thing sort of you know, switches back and forth. You can hear, sometimes hear that. Also, if you're close to a substation, you hear the 60 hertz bus of the mechanical devices. So if you ever go near a substation, you'll hear the 60 hertz buzz. Okay, so those are some you know, things you have to be careful. Does transmission line cause health problems? I, nobody knows, I guess. So we have no proof of any health problems, but you're guaranteed to get a lawsuit. Okay, so almost every month I get an email asking me to appear as a witness because somebody is suing somebody else because they are trying to build a transmission line. Okay, so you can make good money this way, actually. So if you want, if you know you have knowledge and you want to work in a law firm, believe me, there's you know big money there. People are still suing, you know, I think British Columbia is still suing California for something that happened 30 years ago. Okay, so those things goes for a long time, the lines there, people fight over it, and all this things happen, right? But transmission line, basically, if you look at the entire power system, the reason we don't have nice new shiny power system is because we cannot build new transmission lines. So it is it's very, it's extremely difficult to build new transmission lines, at least in uh, US, Canada. Right? So one reason to study transmission lines is we should understand how they work. Okay, if you you know work with a system, you have some transmission lines, take good care of it. Right? Understand how it works with them, understand their characteristics. You know, don't ever ask your boss, I need a new transmission line. Okay, that, that's a way to get fired. Okay, if you ever go to your board and say, oh, I need a new transmission line, uh, that's not something you should ask. Okay, so work with the transmission line you have, and let's look at the models we have. So there are basically two types of transmission lines. Okay, there's two types of transmission lines. One is overhead. So overhead lines are the line you see when you drive along the highway, right? They're overhead lines. One underground. Okay? So underground lines are typically a lot more expensive to build okay? because you need to insulate better. Okay? You need to do insulations around underground lines. You need to dig a trench. And when you dig a trench, you're probably not digging you know, somewhere there's nobody around. You're probably digging through residential and the commercial areas. Okay, so these are that what makes the underground lines a lot more expensive than overhead lines. Right, so you often hear about, you know, so Seattle, you have power outages. If you live in the uh, east side, if you live somewhere in Bellevue, you may have experienced a power outage yesterday. Okay? And the reason is basically we have high wind and the tree falls on the line, the line goes down, you have power outage. And the question is always, why don't we just build, in, build underground lines right, to avoid this problem? And uh, the answer is just uh, very costly to underground lines. Right? So imagine where you live, you have to dig up the ground, putting a line, all that. Okay? So it's quite a bit of challenge when we work with transmission lines. Right? So quite a bit of infrastructure challenge when dealing with this kind of transmission lines. So we talk about transmission lines. So you see this kind of picture quite often when you drive around. So this just give you uh, give us some uh, terminology of how to talk about, it, right? So of course, you know the lines you see are the conductors. Those are the things that carry current. So this carries current. Okay. And what you also see when you look at the tower. Uh, this kind of devices, this kind of devices. Basically, they look like this sort of little disc, right, right on top of each other. If you any, anywhere you go, you know, you see a transmission line, you see this sort of disc. And these are basically the insulators we have. So two lines, they're electrically separate. Okay, so you want some insulators between the lines. We're building a tower. Right? So. And uh, but the way you can tell the voltage of the transmission line is counting the number of this you have in this insulator. So a bigger insulator means higher voltage, the lines carrying higher voltage. So often if you're experienced, if you can take a look at the line, you would know how, what's the voltage level of the line. Okay, so there's something. Okay. 
useful to know sometimes. And then of course we have a big structure that's a tower that carries a lot. So you see this a lot, right? So you'll see, you know, lines all over the place. We have many types of structures carrying lines. Okay? And very often you see this for double circuit lines. Okay, double circuit lines means basically we're carrying two three phase lines in parallel with each other. Okay, so for this kind of line, what we're carrying is we have a three phase ABC. Then we have another three phase ABC. Okay. It's a double circuit line. So you basically have two circuits, right? And in parallel on the same tower going through. So what is the advantage of this constructor? So why do we build you know, two circuits very close to each other? It lets okay. you use the LAN twice. Sorry? Okay. It lets okay. you use the LAN twice. Yes, exactly, right? We use the LAN twice, right? We bought this LAN, we may just well squeeze as much as we can out of this. So why don't we put 10 lines then? So what's limit us for putting like five circuits into here? I mean, you buy the land, you buy everything on top of it, right? So this is, you buy this vertical piece of real estate. Why don't we put like 20 circuits? Uh, spacing between the conductors maybe? Yeah, so one is risers. Yeah, I think, you know, the chat also has a good point. So spacing conductor is one thing. When you put too many conductors together, there's interference, right? So everything is carrying a sinusoidal current. When you have many sinusoidal current going back and forth on conductors, the mutual, that mutually these lines are, are way too coupled. Okay, there's too much interference. Okay, you cannot view this uh, them as separate, separate, separate circuit again. So there's a diminishing rate of return. Okay, when you build more circuits. A second is just you know how big can we build? This infrastructure, right? You know, some it's sometimes difficult to build very big infrastructure carrying many lines. So normally you see this sort of double, triple circuit lines. As you squeeze, you know, as much out of it as possible. But then you don't put too much of it because you know then the coupling becomes too much and the structure is hard to build. Okay. So when you look drive it, when you drive out, you look at the tower is carrying lots of lines. It's basically many sets of three phase lines. This tower is carrying. It's sort of this sort of double circuit lines the tower carries. Okay, so you know there's many different constructors, uh, you know, wooden tower, steel tower, all those kind of things. And uh, so not much to say about this. And uh, they all have insulators. Okay, they all have insulators that uh, that we put in into the circuit to isolate the lines from each other. Okay, so these are the disks COC. And uh, counting this will tell you the voltage. So these are sort of the basic uh, makeup of the transmission lines. So when we do some calculations, we want to ask us when we think about design, as there are several things we have to think about when we design transmission line, right? So when you think of how high we build a tower, okay? when we, so let's say we get to design a transmission line, how high do, how high do we build a tower? Right, how much weight is a lot? So when we talk about high power lines, then the weight becomes an issue. Right, you're spanning this big cable across the distance, so the sort of physical weight of the line becomes a design consideration. Right, so that's the mechanical strength we have on the line, and then we need to think about sort of how far away, how separate they are. Okay. So let's look at this design considerations. So the height of the transmission line is really determined by the voltage. Because you want to be far enough from ground. Okay, so we have a transmission line. It's this, right? So this is ground. So this is the actual ground, the earth. And then we have a line. You're carrying some, you're carrying some current on this line. So what does the ground look to, like to you? We're creating a current. Right, there so, should be an extremely high resistance in between the line and the ground because of the air, or? 
Right, so the ground essentially is a conductor, right? Ground looks somewhat like a conductor. So you're separated by air, right? So this looks actually a, a, like a very poor capacitor in some sense, right? We have, you know, ground is conductor, we have a conductor carrying current. If they're too close, what happens is you can have flashes. So the charge can jump from one conductor to the, basically can jump from the line to ground, or the, you can have flashes between this. So you need to separate them far enough such that it's not easy for the charge to jump. Okay? So the, you, the high clearance space is determined by the voltage. So higher the voltage, the more you're trying to punch, right? You try, the charge tries to jump from basically a very high voltage line to a neutral that's ground. Okay? So you want enough distance to separate out these so that you don't have, you know, uh, sometimes when you do, basically you don't create a lightning bolt between these two things. You, they don't flash over. So this is actually relates to another thing we see in practice. So does anybody know what the highest voltage line we have in the world? What do you know? So what are the highest voltages you see in your transmission line? I don't remember the actual value, but isn't it those like really high DC ones that transport over long distances? Right, so DC lines are very high voltage, but anybody know the val like the ballpark value? Is it uh, 500 kilovolts, one megavolt, 10 megavolts? I think there might be one that's like a megavolt. Right, so the highest one is around a megavolt. Okay. And uh, of course, for this lines, you know, in some sense, the higher the voltage, the better, right? Because we use high voltage lines to reduce uh, current magnitude, so reduce loss. The reason we don't go much higher than that is at higher voltages, sometimes air is not, is not a very good insulator anymore. Okay, so air has some you know, resistance, but if the voltage is high enough, you basically, you just punch through air, right? Air become a conductor if the voltage is high enough. Okay, so this puts an upper limit to how high the voltage can be. And generally higher the voltage, the higher the line you need to put. So these are, again, there are standards you can look up. So we won't do the calculation with the height, but if you want it, you can look up you know, tables. that will tell you how far it should clear. And this has to do with you know, as, you know, the humidity of the air, different kinds of things. But this is a general consideration for the height of the transmission line. Okay, so a width of a transmission line, right? So this again, uh, so this uh, basically one is how high, one is how far apart they are. You have two lines. And you need to, them to be far apart because again, you don't want two conductors to come too close to each other. Right? Otherwise flashes, right? You have basically current flow. Current will jump from one kind to the other. And because we have wind, so when winds are blowing, this conductor starts to move. So you want them far apart, they don't get too close to each other. Right, so these are sort of physical considerations we have when building transmission lines. So you want them high above the ground, you want them far apart. So now let's look at mechanical strains, right? So mechanical strains is basically we have, we're suspending a cable, right? So this is basically the cable looks something like this. All right, and sometimes this cable falls down. Okay? Sometimes the cable fails and falls down. And often the reason is because you have very high wind or you have a bad ice storm. Okay? So what we're afraid of most of the time for transmission lines is actually ice storms. Okay? Not so much hurricane. So you have a big hurricane, it doesn't wipe out really that many transmission, high voltage transmission lines. What well, wipes tends to wipe out transmission lines is ice storms. Okay, so, for example, some picture, uh, not so much in Seattle, but uh, you see, you know, other parts of the country, you have a lot of ice. Then ice, you know, collects on the line. The line becomes very heavy, and the tower falls over. Okay, so these are sort of the not something that's unexpected, but you need to sort of calculate the mechanical strength, right? how much. What is the mechanical strength of a line that has to withstand this kind of ice storm and wind storms? Right, any questions so far?
Okay, so now let's look at how do we make a line strong, right? So how do you make this kind of transmission lines? So it's not a single wire, right? The takeaway message is nobody just get a big piece of metal and make a single strand out of it, right? That is not how we make transmission lines. So we make transmission lines by basically making a bundle of connectors. So we'll make a bundle connector. And uh, the way we do it is basically we'll have something that's in the middle. So the core of the transmission line, this is normally steel. This is for tension. Okay, so it's not for carrying current, the middle part of it. Okay. So, and the, the outside as conductors, so we have aluminum strands. On the outside, that's conducts electricity, that's conduct electricity. And then we normally twist this. So normally you take this line and twist it like this way, like your telephone wire. This is the uh, most common setup of a transmission line. We have a core that provides mechanical strength. Steel is a you know strong metal and uh, so alloy, and you put conductors around it right, to provide strength. Okay, so last thing, right? So we're putting a steel core, right? We're putting a steel core. There are two reasons for it. One is this add mechanical strength. Okay, one adds mechanical strength, right? We want a strong material. But then if you think about this line design, so we said one thing we need to be aware is that if we have ice storm or wind storm and the line starts to start to move, we don't want to hit something. What else can cause a line to change uh, the way it's being shaped? What, what else can change a line? Right, so heat. So where does heat come from? Right, so the chat. Right, so we resistance. pass current. Resistance, right? So the line has some resistance. So we pass current through the line, we heat it up. So the line heats up, what happens to it? Transfer from the power. Sorry? Can I repeat that? The power is the consume. Right, so it consumes more power, right? So it heats up. Uh, so resistor, resistor consumes power, power goes to heat. But if you look at a line, once it starts to heat up, what do you see? So mechanically, what happens to a line once it starts to heat up? It'll sag. Why does it sag? Because the wire is longer. Right, thermal expansion, right? So we have thermal expansion. If it heats up, the thing gets longer. It has to go somewhere, right? So the only place to go is to sag. Okay, so if you have, right? So you have a, this is low current. But if you try to pass a lot of current, what happens this is the high current. Because you have thermal extension, right? so the lines go somewhere. So when we have steel core, this helps with the thermal extension also. And this helps with that. This helps with that. So that's another reason why you have a core material that doesn't really carry. That doesn't carry a current. Okay, then you not to carry current. Okay, so as we said, you know, it's heats up, it always have sagging, so the thing expands. That's the uh, so we uh, we have sagging. So, but if we look at the design, right? So we basically said we'll make the many strands of conductors to carry electricity. Why don't we do something like this, right? Why don't we have a core, but then just put a continuous sort of thing around it? Why don't we just put a continuous conductor around this? Why do we have many strands carrying power? 
carrying current. Cheaper to make, maybe? One is cheaper to make. There's something else, though. There's sort of a physics reason why we have strength. Okay. So let's look at a how Eddy electricity. Currents. Sorry? Eddy currents? Uh, yes, has to do with eddy currents. Has to do with eddy currents. Okay. So what has what happens is let's look at what happens to the current, right? So let's say we have a so think of this as a big conductor. Okay. That's a big conductor, the whole piece you know, of conductor. Now if I flow sunny, let's say we ha I have a current flow. AC current flow. AC current flowing out of this conductor. I say it's flowing towards us. It's flowing, to, uh, it's flowing towards us with some current flow. Does the current uniformly distribute through this conductor? So you look at the cross area. Does the current just sort of uniformly spread out in the cross area? So how does current flow, right? So you have this conductor, I pass AC current align. I not chop it, I look at a cross section. Where do you think has more current? Or do you think less current? Or are they just uniformly in this circle? I know in some cases in circuits, it tends to the surface. It tends to the surface, right? And it tends to the surface when we have sinusoidal current flow. So when we have AC current flow. Where the current goes is actually current just flows on the surface, okay? Just flows on the surface. So current basically only flows in this very shallow surface layer, okay? It does not want to go into the middle of the conductor. And this is called the skin effect. It says if you pass sinusoidal current through a conductor, most of the charges actually move in the, in the skin. The middle of the conductor doesn't carry much current, or none at all, actually, in some cases. Okay? So the reason that we build strands is you have more skin area, you have more surface area. Okay, so current is carried basically proportional to the surface area we have to the sorry, not to the surface area, to the uh, perimeter, right, of the each conductor to the cross-sectional area. So you basically want more, you know, surfaces so you can have that's more efficient for current flow. Okay, so you have many strands to deal with the fact that you have a skin effect. So to deal with the, you have skin effect, okay? So more strands is more efficient also because of this, All right? So there's mechanical reasons, there's sort of cost reasons, and there's a you know, having to do with fundamentally how current flows in a conductor, right? So this again comes from uh, electromagnetic waves, right? So this is comes from analyzing wave equations, but uh, you can think of this sort of as a nice uh, practical application of those equations, right? But this is, will be our uh, transmission line. Most of the time, you see transmission line like this. So we just take it and open it up, it will look something like this. If I have overhead line, a sagging conductor is, of course, not good, right? Sagging conductor is not good because you may have a tree here, and once you have a tree, once it hits a tree, this is, you know, bad things happen. Okay. Bad things happen if you hit a tree. So we, that's why we have current limit on transmission lines. So current limit on transmission lines is not when, we, when you will melt the transmission line. It's very hard to melt a transmission line. Right? You will, you need a lot of current to do that. What happens is, at least for this overhead transmission lines, current limit exists because you don't want the lines to sag too much. Okay, so that's where current limits come from. This limits current on overhead lines. Okay, so when you buy a transmission line, you'll say this transmission line is rated at 230 kV, uh, one megawatt right, of current, or you see, or you see something one megawatt power. This basically limits the current flow, so you don't sag. Okay, so there's thermal limit on the lines. We need to be careful about. Okay. Any questions about this overhead transmission lines? Okay, so 
yeah. question. Yeah. So why we put aluminum the outside like so the steel? Oh, why the material aluminum? It's a good conductor. It's a, it's a, it's a good, good conductor. But why you put aluminum outside the steel like the? Oh, so steel provides the uh, tensile strength, right? Steel provides oh. the strength. So steel core is actually the, the thing that's thinking about carrying the weight of the line. Yes. Right, so steel carries this. So that provides the tension in the line. But if I want to remove the aluminum string. So aluminum is not a strong material as steel, right? Okay. Oh yeah. Right. So this all aluminum is not a very strong line. Yes. It's a very sort of flappy line in some sense. Right. So steel makes a much stronger line. Okay. But aluminum also carries the current. Only so aluminum very... carries the current. Steel does not carry current. Okay. Steel, okay. steel should not carry current for this kind of design. Okay. Right. Steel should okay. not carry current. Why is steel not carrying current? But steel is also the conductor. Not a very good conductor. Right? There's a bad, good conductors and bad conductors. Okay. When you talk about this for high voltage ones, you know, the good conductors matter. So okay. aluminum is a pretty good conductor. Uh, copper, so for some lower voltage, we use copper. Okay, so, but uh, steel by itself is not a very good conductor, at least at this voltage levels. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so this is overhead line design. So if you look at underground lines, so underground is uh, more expensive, right? Because they're underground and they have to be insulated. And so when you look at over high voltage transmission line overhead, they're not normally insulated. It's open to air. But for underground lines, obviously that's not what you want to do. So you have to insulate them. And the way this works is, so we still have conductors. Okay? So we have conductors. So is this still stranded conductor? Then we have insulation. Around the conductor, we have a shield around the insulation. We need to actually, it cannot be directly underground yet, it right? doesn't touch the soil yet. You have some backfill, then you have a soil, right? Awesome. So there's a lot of uh, steps to install a underground transmission line. And the thermal resistance is higher. So it's harder to get heat out of this slice. It's harder to get heat out of this slice. So that's why sometimes they carry less current. Because anytime you pass current through this, especially underground lines will generate heat. But because it's underground, the heat doesn't get out as easy. Okay, so we need this a major design consideration for underground lines is how much heat can we dissipate out of this slice. And sometimes when you have when you have to have carry high current, you actually have sort of liquid cooling around these lines. You see liquid cooling around the lines because you need to get heat out somehow. Okay. So you have oil oscillation, you have different coolants you can oscillate. You may see this, for example, if you go to a downtown area. Right? So downtown Seattle, downtown New York, you know, downtown San Francisco, lines tend to be underground. They, they may have to carry a lot of power you have to cool them. You have to be careful how you cool these lines. So anybody lives in the dorm for UW? Anybody living in the one of the student dorms to the West campus side? So if you live there, there are basically underground lines running under your dorm. Okay, so there's underground, the, how the university, how the main campus gets power is through those underground lines and running under your door. And they create a lot of problems for us. Okay, so our facility people spend a lot of time thinking about those lines. How much power they're carrying, the insulation, the heat dissipation. Okay, so these are sort of real problems that the deal is for underground lines. Okay, so if you go out to work for, with Saturday City Light, 
uh, you may see a lot of uh, things that we have to do for a lot of all the underground lands around the city. Right. I have a question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, back in the old day, what does the green filling indicate? Oh, green filling? So you can think of this as a insulation that provides some of the strength for the cable also. So you can think of this part as, you know, uh, separating out the strength you have. So have we, if we have three phase lines or if we have different, uh, different strengths, we need some separation. So you can think of this also as a part of the insulation. Is, is this picture showing a, a single phase or are those all three phases in the same cable? There should be three phases in the same cable. Yeah, I think this picture is showing three phases in the same cable. Uh, and why are you able to get away with such a small separation between the phases? Oh, just you just live with much higher couplings. So uh, you don't get away with it per se as you deal with it. Right? So, right? so the cost of putting three lines far apart uh, is a lot more painful than having harder, more advanced calculations to deal with the fact that there's mutual couplings. Right? So that's... So if you go on to take the course 457, I believe, distribution systems, I, I don't remember exactly the name, the uh, number, the whole course is spin out what happens to these lines. Okay, how do we model them? And uh, the short answer is you have a nine by nine matrix you have to carry around and do calculations with, right? So we don't get away with it, it's just the computer program becomes a lot more advanced or a lot more uh, there's a lot more details you have to think about when we write a computer program. Okay, so distribution system is its own models are not a lot more sophisticated than what we write in here. You know, things are closer, there's more coupling and uh, uh, for different reasons like that. Okay. I have another question. Yeah, uh, go ahead. For the third, so the last point about the forced oil circulation, yeah. how how would that look like in when when added to this diagram? Oh, okay. So you basically pump it in here, right? So you pump it in here. You basically surround this thing. Imagine by running water. That's one way you can cool it. Right? So water may not be the best coolant you use. You can use oil to cool this also. Just pumping this where this sort of backfill is. Okay, so it's like. Uh... The cable would be like running in a larger yeah in a larger tube. tank yeah in okay. a tank and then you, you basically you have to circulate the coolant in the tank to carry away heat okay thank you yeah so that's uh, you don't see that very uh you don't see that all the time i don't think the lines under you know powering our campus have liquid cooling but some downtown area you'll see liquid cooling yeah, you'll see like quickly. Cool. So yeah, so that's uh you know that adds another layer of complexity into system design. Right. So and so you know distribution power distribution system engineering is by far I'll say the most in demand class that's asked by utilities and the least taught class at the uh, colleges. I think that's what I will say. <laughs> Right, so every every year we get emails from our local utility asking us, you know, please give us ten people who can who knows distribution systems following, and we say only three people take the class. Right, so if you want a job, take that class. Some utility will hire you. There's a lot of demand for people who really understand distribution systems yeah, because there's it's complicated. Right, so it's a lot of things you have to see to understand. Right? So no, something to think about if you're interested. Is this uh, something to uh, look at for the next course? I'm interested. But I don't remember. I will look it up. I'll look it up. I, I don't remember the exact number because it's not taught very often. So truth be told, it's not taught very often. We're trying to get more people to take it. So I will look up the number of what exactly distribution system engineering is. I'll email it out. Right? So, but that's something to think about. There's a lot of engineering questions going on. If you know that, all the utilities will hire you. In the US, every utility will give you an offer if you really know that. 
So let us you know, look more at underground cables, right? So let's look more at underground cables. That's one more slide. Okay. So what you worry about is really, see another thing that happens with underground cables is you don't see what's wrong with them. Yeah, so they may just work all, they may work for, you know, 20 years and one day they just stop working. And because this is what happens in Auckland is you have a cable and you, they were carrying a little bit too much current on the cable than we were, were supposed to. So they basically, the insulation, they start to, you know, break the insulation down. And then the cable touch the ground soil, right? Then that becomes, you know, you essentially grounding yourself. So you have a short circuit fault. And that wasn't figured out. It's very hard to figure out this kind of things because it's underground. And so how do you tell I, my insulation is trying to break down? If I don't see the cable, like the point is not to see this cable. So that's a question that all the utilities are struggling with. Okay. So if some of you have fancy, you know, imaging techniques, if you fan, you have fancy AI techniques that you want, you have, you want to solve this kind of problem, you can try to detect faults. If you have, you know, new sensors that can detect uh, insulation breakdown, uh, there's good money in this. Okay, because a lot of things that takes a long time to fix. There's an underground cable that goes because we didn't know there's something wrong with it. Okay. So these are the things to think about, right? When you work on. So if you want, you know, yeah. So you have some way, you know, if you say, okay, I can measure small changes in current. Okay, if I can somehow tell you there's something wrong with the installation, you should go and fix it. That's a very compelling application. Right. Or you can have a new sensor that can measure this kind of thing. Right. We're sort of very lacking in this regard as a field. Right. This something may not be very, you know, cutting edge. You may not think this is cutting edge, but this is useful. And this is actually very hard to do for us right now. Okay. So yeah, you see more and more outage like this. Right. So you know, if you're you want to have a startup idea, you're somehow you can detect this problem early, that's a very good thing. Okay. Very good thing for the field. So, okay, so now is a good point. Let's take a break. We'll break for 10 minutes. When we come back, we'll look at equations. Okay, so that was the, uh, I guess, high level look at transmission lines. When we come back, we'll look at the circuit models. We'll look at, you know, how do we get the inductance out of it? How do we get the capacitance out of the circuit? Okay, so we'll come back at 10.30. Any question with the homework, you can ask now or other things like that. Professor, yeah, um, I had a question just about power outages. So I live on the east side, yeah. and my power did go out yesterday. Yes. Um, but like before it was going out, right, lights were flickering, and like I was getting a couple intermittent, like it would go out for maybe a second or two, yeah. more than just a flicker, and then come back right. on. Yeah. And I started thinking about it, and I was really could not come up with a solid answer of why that happens and why it doesn't mm -hmm. just go out and stay out versus right. okay. flicker. Like okay, like, so that's right. Yeah, it's a good question. So there's a couple of reasons. So one is maybe voltage issues. So sometimes you have voltage flickers in the system. So if your voltage drops very low, you may see a flicker and the voltage may recover. What you also see in this is, some, is protection issues. Okay, so per, sometimes, so protection works the following way. So I'm gonna draw this, uh, let me insert a page and draw this here. So this is this is a side protection. Okay, so how does protection work, right? So basically when you have a line, you have a breaker on both sides of the line. So you have they should be the similar size. So I break two breakers on both sides of the line, something like this, right? So what does your breaker detect? Your breaker basically detects a surging current, right? So you have an open switch. So if a surging current, so you have a current surge. Oh, it'll trip the breaker. Well, open, well, open. So this one, you see a flicker. Your basically your power goes out. 
but it doesn't just open and stay open. Mm -hmm. Okay, what this does is after a few, you know, after some time, maybe a second or so, this thing will try to close again because the third current search may be temporary. Right? Maybe some other part of the system has a problem because the current search will open to prevent equipment damage, but then we'll try to close. So if it closes successfully, then it's fine. So this, the whole line trips the following way. If it tries to close, if still sees the current, so uh, this to one, uh, this is success. This is okay, the whole line stays on. Mm -hmm. If this fails a couple of times, you can code this into the protection. And this opens and you have to close it manually. Somebody has closed it manually. Okay. And you see this kind of flicker, yeah. I see. And so your switch is trying to close. Sometimes they can, sometimes they don't. So, so pretty much it'll shut, and if there's still a current surge, it'll open back up again. Yeah, it'll open back up. So you have both sides. This will open. This will see there's no more current. This will open. And this will close. This will close. Okay. I'll see whether it works or not. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, then you both open again. So do they all work in pairs then? Yes. So circuit switcher mostly works on this both end of the line. Okay. Most times you have two sort of two breakers on both ends. There's uh -huh. a coordinate fashion. This is actually hard coded into it. Huh. So if you're a microcontroller, you know, hard coding this and they will open in sequence and close it. Um, I kind of have a piggyback question off of that yeah. then. So there's a box in my neighborhood that I noticed was just wide open when yeah. I was driving past. It's a pretty big, like four foot by like three foot box, maybe yeah. green door panels that open mm -hmm. up like this. Yeah. And it had a bunch of wires inside of it in yeah. kind of like stacks. Yeah. Looked like someone had been doing something in there. Right. Do you do you know what that is? That could be a transformer you have. It was on the ground. Yeah, so the transformer will be okay. on. The, you may have a transformer on the ground. So maybe a transformer, maybe a capacitor you have to boost the voltage. It will generally have some protection equipment like this inside of it. Okay. Yeah. So those are every neighborhood you see that. So you see that every neighborhood they will have a box. As a transformer, a compa you know, a shunt compressor for boosting voltage may have this round protection coming inside of it. Yeah, I think someone must have been like working or looking at it at least, and they yeah. left it wide open. Yeah, that should not happen. You don't want to <laughs> right? So you know, yeah, a lot yeah, of times, like, yeah, squirrels will get into it, and you know, basically what happens, you get a squirrel that's you know very well barbecued. <laughs> I had to pull it out. <laughs> the snack for the coyotes later. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I have a question kind of on sure. the yeah, yeah. remaining. Uh, yeah. I had an interview sure. question the other day that I was kind of struggling to answer. Mm -hmm. So, say you have like some power system. Right. And at some point, you have a load that exceeds generation. You can't mm -hmm. have any more generation. Right. I would assume that voltage regulation would mean the voltage wouldn't drop at all. But I wasn't really sure what else would happen. Like, the current to the system would remain the same because the generation couldn't produce anymore, correct? Not quite. Not quite. So, so let's think about it, right? So let's say you're generating something, and the load increases. So it's really not the voltage. You don't see the voltage changing that quickly. What you see is the frequency in the system changing quickly. Okay, so and the background is the following, right? So we have a 60 hertz system, right? So, but what in the system is actually at 60 hertz, right? So mechanically, as your computer doesn't offer at 60 hertz, it doesn't care what frequency it is. So mechanically, what things are 60 hertz for us? Uh, the generators. The generators, right? Generators are rotating at 60 hertz. But because they're big mechanical devices, they have rotational inertia. So there are some stored energy within the, just because the generators are rotating. So when the, what happens is when the load exceeds generation, the generators want to give more energy, right? So you may not be putting more fuel into the generator, but because this storage in the inertia, in the rotational inertia of the generator, what happens is the generator tends to slow down a little bit. Okay, so you pull energy that way. 
right? You have this rotating energy, rotating mass, or slow down slightly, you pull more energy. So the current can go up, right? You may just apply more current to the load. So this makes sure, this says the electric energy out of the generator will supply the load. But the frequency drops because you're pulling energy out of your mechanical storage, basically, this rotating storage. Then what happens is the generator has a, has a feedback loop. Okay? With the feedback loop does is it measures the rotational frequency. If it sees it drops below 60 hertz, we'll start to giving more fuel, right? So if it's a gas, just pump more gas into it. That kind of idea. Right? If it's a hydro, open up the gate, right? this kind of idea. So you get more energy into it. So we put this thing back to 60 hertz. Conversely, if your load drops, this thing spins, speeds up, right? Because it's getting more energy. It's getting more energy. There's less power going out. So energy gets stored and spins up, spins faster. Then this feedback loop will see it and start putting less uh, chemical energy, basically, right? If it's a thermal power plant into it. So you keep this at 60 hertz. So this is actually a very neat way of detecting the loading balance in the system without any communication between the load and generator. You just have to measure this rotational frequency. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll cover that. So the last topic in the class is probably frequency stability. We'll go into more detail into that. Yeah, so, yeah, so remember the electrical power generated has to be always equal to the electrical, electrical load consumed if the system is providing any power at all, right? So basically we're borrowing, we're doing a very short term, borrowing from the, gen, from the rotating mass of the generators. Or the synchronous rotating mass. Right? So that's what we have. So when people say there's no storage in the grid, that's not 100% correct. We do have very short time storage, right? Very short time scale storage. We don't have longer time storage, but we do have mechanical storage, right? So it's not a system that's where, you know, the mechanical power is always exactly equal to the load. That's not how it works. There's some buffer that happens at the generators. Okay, so at some point, if a load exceeds generation for too long, it's just going to sap up all the energy from the generators. Yeah, then you then then that's a big problem. Then this, then the system fails. Right, system fails when that happens. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but normally that takes you know it's not immediate, right? That takes some time, and uh, if people notice the frequency is dropping. You may call emergency generation, or you may, you know, unless some generator exceeds their limits, or you may even drop loads, or things you can do to correct for this. I had a question on the homework. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so for question six, in terms of like converting to a circuit or per unit yeah. diagram, um, I'm, I'm trying to compare how to like convert the, the load. And so in the, in a, an example you gave in a previous lecture, the, yeah. the load had a power factor. So you could like mm -hmm. get the reactive and active power right. and then divide by the power base. Yeah. Um, since the homework doesn't provide a power factor, I guess, mm -hmm. um, do I just assume the power factor is one? No, so you can just give it in a uh, parent power. Right, you can give it in the apparent power or complex power. So you can see, you can just say this as whatever per unit. And uh, if you draw a motor, we understand it to be the apparent power. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. We understand it to be. Right, because in this problem, the generator also doesn't say it was a power factor, right? We just give the mm -hmm. apparent power rating for all of them. So mm -hmm. you can just give it in per unit. They'll be understood exactly as you know this system is understood so that's just a power rating of the motor i see okay thank you yeah other questions for the homework okay so if not let's look at some equations for our transmission lines okay, so 
Right. So the goal is we're going to take a transmission line, model it by discrete components, right? So the RLC, discrete components RLC. So we can again do circuit analysis. Right? So how do we get there? Well, so let's look at piece by piece, right? Let's look at piece by piece. So let's look at resistance first. Okay, let's look at resistance. Resistance is in some sense the easiest one to understand because it's a material will have some resistance. So DC resistance just means the part that's not frequency responsive. Okay, it doesn't matter what the frequency is. And the resistance will be rho LA with a unit of ohms. And this is as expected, right? as the scales as expected. Rho is the resistivity. of the material, okay, so how resistive is it? The higher number means the larger resistance. L is the length of the conductor, right? It's a longer conductor, the more resistance it has. A is a cross-sectional area. Right, so the larger the conductor, the lower resistance. Right, so this is expected, but one thing that's tricky and uh, which was hard for me coming from Canada is this. What do you think the unit for the cross-sectional area is? Okay, so being Americans, what do you think the unit is? It's not a nice unit, it's not SI unit. What do you think this unit is? A has a unit, it's gauge. Uh, I, okay, so I, I don't know the unit gauge. So I don't, but what, so what the, I have seen in the, in the US is A is giving the following units. A circular mills, okay? Written as C mill, C M I L. What is this? This is the area of a circle having a diameter of one inch, of one mil, sorry, one mil. And the mil is 10 to the minus three inches. Okay, this is a unit. Right? So think of a circle with a diameter of 10 to the minus three inches. That's a base area we'll use. Okay, so why? I don't know, but uh, that's a sort of common unit you'll see. Okay, so yeah, this was confusing for a lot of Canadian people, why the unit happens out to be this way. But, okay. So you see things like giving you this kind of units, just understand it as a base unit. Okay, we measure everything relative to a circle with a diameter that's 10 to the minus three inches. That's just how we measure this units. So the larger the cross section area, the smaller the resistance. And resistance happens to also scale linearly with temperature. Okay, happens to scale linearly with temperature. So the higher the temperature, higher the temperature, the higher the resistance we have. The higher the resistance we have. And uh, so it's approximately linear in this term, but uh, you can look up values for this if you want to, but this is just something to keep in mind, right? So the harder it is, the more uh, the scales linearly, okay? So these are the value we'll give, we'll give the value to you. So if we ever ask you to do a question about temperature dependence, we'll tell you the exact dependence on this. Okay? So you don't have to memorize values or memorize this equation. It's given to you. One thing interesting is, you know, to look at the, to keep in mind that resistance is depend on the frequency, right? Because we have skin effect, right? As we covered. So for DC, DC flow, this is roughly uniform across the conductor. 
But for AC flow, we have skin effect. So the higher the frequency, the more the current gets pushed to the boundary of the conductor. Okay. And uh, what this implies, uh, this basically resistance goes up. Because you're not using as much conductor to flow your current. Right, so this A value, this A value effectively goes down. We have skin effect because you're looking at a smaller cross sectional area. Turns out the calculations for exactly how resistance scales with frequency can be done and can be simulated pretty accurately using computer models. But for us, this is normally sort of giving a table. Okay, so you can look it up in a table, or now that you punch into a computer, a computer will tell you what the R value is. Okay, so for this class, just remember the frequency has an impact. So you're not getting as much conductor surface area, conductor cross section area as you think. Okay? But uh, you know, just be mindful of that. This will start to matter more if you go to higher frequency. Right? For example, you you know, if you're doing something like a waveguide that this will matter more. But for us, it's just a number that we'll look up in a table. All right, so this is for resistance. Basically, resistance value is uh, something we'll look up in a table. Inductance is, happens because we have, we're passing a current, we're passing a sinusoid, sinusoidal current through a conductor. So this will look at least somewhat like a resist, like a inductor. Okay, this will look somewhat like inductor. So let's look at, you know, have a rough idea of where these things come from, but we won't do detailed calculations for inductance. Okay, we won't do that much detailed calculations. But to understand it, this inductance happens because we're passing, right? We're passing a time varying current through a conductor and that will set up a magnetic field. And that will always create a magnetic field. And this magnetic field creates an inductor for us. It's creating an inductor for us. The exact integrals we will not do, okay? We won't do the exact integrals. It's in the book if you want to look it up. In the, you can go read the book and figure out how the uh, how we how you integrate this field to figure out the dependence and uh, the values. We won't do it. Okay? So, you know, for us, we're just keep in mind that uh, this is driven by Maxwell's equations. We'll do the calculation for capacitance. That turns out to be an easier calculation for us to do. Okay, voltage turns out to be an easier calculation. Current turns out to be a you know, not comparatively more tricky calculation. So we'll save the equation deriving until the, you know, when, when we get to the capacitor case. But for now, we'll go through the equations we have. Okay, so given a line, what is the inductance? Right? How do we model as an inductor? Okay, we'll just look at the equations and think about whether equations make sense or not. Okay, so, Let's look at what happens when we have this kind of idea, okay? So let's say we have two, right? So we have, let's say we have two conductors. We have, you know, current in one conductor, return current in another. We have this kind of setup. And then they have, and then what happens is they both have some current, time varying current going through them. So you can think of the, this circuit, these two wires can be modeled as an inductor. Okay, these two wires passing time varying current looks like somewhat like an inductor if you look from the outside. Okay, there's some interaction of magnetic field. And uh, how does this depend on things? Well, so let's, think, let's write down. So the inductance, okay, so it turns out the flux depend on the material, okay, the material in between them, which is air. The log, the natural log, 
of the distance divided by how big the wires are. Okay, so if you do the calculation, it comes down to this kind of equations. And so the inductance is basically just a flux over current, right? So inductance to get into a value of Henry's we have is the inductance. This is L is lambda over I. So the material in between them, right? The free space or air log of the distance divided by this two, R1 prime, R2 prime, have a unit of Henry per meter. Okay. And R prime is this scaled value of how big the wires are. The scale value of how big the wires are. Okay, this is just our inductance. So, to understand how we get it, uh, we need uh, to So not much we can, yeah. So without going to the equations, not much more we can say about it. Uh, for you, just remember this equation, right? So remember this depends on the material, depends on the size of the conductors, depends on how far apart they are. Okay, these are the values it depends on. And in a particular way, it depends on this equation. Okay, it depends on this form. Okay, so uh, we just we'll use this equation, right? We'll look at some of the implications of this equation. Yeah, we'll look at some implications of this. So, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, go ahead. Professor, yeah. this is R prime. So R prime is defined. So R is how big is the radius of the conductor. R prime is just R times e to the minus one quarter. R times e to the minus one quarter. Okay. Yeah. Can you see? Can you see this? Oh, I saw. The, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, R one prime is R one e to the minus one quarter. R two prime is R two minus e. So there are reasons why this factor comes out. Okay, there are reasons why this comes out. Has to do with integrating the exponential of something, right? But for us, this is so basically the wire appears slightly smaller, right? So it's sort of slightly smaller than the actual than the actual size of the wire for this for EM calculations. So yeah. Okay, so then let's look at some discussion, right? So in for a circuit, what we have is remember this induct has a value of x. Okay, so X is the circular frequency times the inductance, right? So this gives us a value of ohms per meter. Okay. So let's think about it. Do we want X small or large? That's from a physical system design criteria. Right, so we, the, basically the wire looks like somewhat inductor. Do we want a big inductor or a small inductor? Why small? Why small? Less losses. Less reactive power losses, right? So an inductor consumes only reactive power. But a wire can only carry so much apparent power. So if you have to carry more reactive power, it will carry less active power. So it's not as efficient. So the reason is we want this to be small. Okay. We want a small inductor, right? The smaller the inductor, the more ideal the wire is, right? So ideal wire is always better. Right? So how do we make it small? How do we make it small? Well, we can make D large, sorry, D small, R large, okay. right? So we can make the distance smaller and make the wires bigger, right? So this tells us we have a small inductor. So does this make 
happens, let's think about it intuitively. So why is a smaller D makes us look like a smaller inductor? Why small? Why, why is smaller better intuitively? Can we explain this? I, mean, I think I get the question. Yeah. But... Okay, so let's think about it, right? So let's take an extreme case, right? Let's say they're right on top of each other. Okay, let's think of the extreme case. Extreme case, let's say these wires are really close, okay? right next to each other. Okay? One is carrying current one way, one is carrying current the other way. Uh, this, why, why is this small inductor? Well, if you draw something around this, the currents almost cancel out, right? So in the extreme case, when the wires are really close, one is passing current one way, one is passing current the other way. So the net current, when you look at this thing, is very small. Okay, so from for the areas around this, two conductors when they're very close, seems like there's no current because they're canceling out in this regard, okay? So the smaller the D, the smaller the impact that the magnetic field has. Okay, whereas the larger the D, these are really far apart, okay? So the field can interact more, okay? So the field can interact more, okay, right? So if they're right on top of each other, then the current cancels out, there's no field, okay? It's the constant current. If there are no, so the closer they are, so the more cancellation you have for the magnetic field, and that's why you see a smaller conductor, a smaller inductance. That's the same reason why R wants to be large. As the larger they are, so the more the field, the magnetic field around them gets squished together, and you have you have a cancellation of the field. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the idea of, so you, you know, so be, that's intuitive the idea, right? So you want, you know, the larger it is, the more fields gets developed, the field can interact more. The closer it is, because they're carrying current in different directions, when they're very close, the fields seem to cancel each other. Okay, with one field rotating one way, the other field will rotate the opposite direction, they will cancel. Okay, so the effect value of the inductance will be smaller. Okay. That's why we want a small d, large r, okay, for this kind of thing. But however, right, so we cannot make this very small, right? So you cannot be too small because we don't want the wires touching each other. Okay, right? so even though we want it to be small, we want the field to, you know, to be close and cancel each other, they should not touch. So it cannot be super, you know, it cannot be super small. And the R large is expensive. Right, so it's costly. So there's a limit of how small we can reduce reactants to. And normally there will be some reactants left over. So normally we cannot ignore the reactants on the lot. Right, there's some value and uh, this value is typically not too small. Okay, not too small right, because of this equation. Right, because we're separating all the wires and the R is fundamentally not a very large value. Right, so we cannot build it to be very large. So to take, you know, the thing to remember from this is that we engineer wires, you know, engineer them, uh, we'll engineer this value to be as small as possible, but typically this will dominate the R term. Okay, R is typically much smaller than X in per unit terms. Okay, so those are two conductors. We, we have, you know, we can have three conductors. And we'll try to extend this equation. Okay, we'll try to extend this equation to multiple conductors. We we'll have three phase, right? We'll have three phase lines or multiple conductors per phase. So the idea is following. Okay? Basically, the assumption we'll make is the radius are very small. The radii are small. Okay. 
and the distances between them in dominant. Okay, so D dominance. Okay, so this gives our way to derive sort of easier equations, easier looking equations we can handle. And the equations become out in the following way. Okay, so right, so in algebraic, this is means the separation between conductor I and conductor J is much larger than the radius of conductor K. Okay, and this holds for all I, J, K, for all conductors. So for And the way it just sums to be, then it becomes the following formula. It becomes the following formula. So flux linking for conductor one will look something like lambda one equals two mu zero. This is a common factor we have. I one natural log of one over R one prime plus I two natural log of one over D one two plus I N natural log of one over D one N. Okay, this is our, what the equation comes out to be. And then we have the flux thinking conductor K. This is lambda K. Same equation, we just switch out the index I1 log of one over D, the distance from K to one plus I K natural log of its own radius plus I N natural log of one over D K. And again, R prime, uh, the scaled version of the old resistance. So, so not much, you know, about why this happens. It just if you work through the formula, this is sort of the way it comes out. Okay. So uh, let's just assume, you know, these are the equations. We'll look at how it reduces in some cases. And uh, we'll do more work for the capacitance case to get a feeling for why similar equations comes out. But let's you know, look at a, so one uh, example, professor, yeah, go ahead. For, for the lambda one is like mu now over two pi times times other thing is that is the I one natural law of uh, one over the R one prime. R one prime, yes, it's R one prime. R one prime is just R one times the e to the minus yeah. quarter. Yes. Yeah, just a way, yeah, just a way this equations work out. Not, not much more we can say at this point. Right? So let's do one example. We'll make this more clear. We'll make this or equation seems uh, to make more sense. So let's look at the, this case. So let's look at, you know, we're carrying three phase. Okay, A, B, C. In a equilateral, sorry, in a uh, equal distance form. Okay, so they're all separate out by D, they're all separate out by D. And the, let's look at, you know, what is the inductance we can compute? Okay, let's look at how we can compute inductances. And so in this case, right, so let's look at different phase, right? Let's look at different phase. We have phase A, okay, phase A, this is mu naught over two pi. The nice thing is the numbers are the same. So we have a lot simplification. Natural log one over D plus IC natural log one over D. Okay, so the rest are the, you know, the phase B and C are the uh, similar formula. Okay. But for three phase systems, right? For three phase systems, we know that uh, IA plus IB plus IC equal to zero, right? They all cancel out. 
So what we have is we have IB plus IC equals minus IA. Okay. And let's simplify our formula because lambda A is now mu naught, 2 pi. IA plus IB plus IC log 1 over D, right? As we have this thing. But this is minus IA. Okay, this is minus IA. So I have this log equation, right? I want so what is minus IA log 1 over D? Well, I can put this minus sign inside the log, right? This equals to IA log over D, natural log of D, right? I put the minus sign inside. So you come to this equation, this is mu naught over two pi, IA log of one over RA prime over RA prime plus IA log D. Uh, so I can, instead of writing this as addition of logs, I can collect things inside the log, log of D over RA prime. Okay, this is log over RD of RA prime. This implies the inductance of a single phase. This is phase A, this is mu naught over two pi, log of D over RA prime, carry per meter. No, not Harry for me. Oh, uh, Professor, can you go yeah. scroll, a little, scroll down a little bit? Go down a little Yes. Yes. And okay. also, I think there's a minus sign like the in front of the IA natural law of the. Oh. Yeah, so I put this inside, right? So I wouldn't, I put the minus IA, I put the minus sign inside the log. So minus log of 1 over D equals to log D. Oh, thank you. Right, so the, that's the uh, property of a log, log. So put inside the log, so it becomes IA log D. Then IA becomes a common factor I can factor out. The summation of logs is a log of the product. Then the inductance comes out. This is so this is how the equations work, right? So again, you won't be asked to derive this type of equations. Okay? You won't be asked to derive this. Uh, you just have to know, for example, this equation, right? The so question says, you know, you have a balanced three phase circuit with equal distance and give you a bunch of parameters, you know, there's, you, you should know using, we should use this equation. To compute, okay, we should know we should we uh, use this equation to compute the inductance. Okay. Uh, we won't ask you to derive any equations like this. We won't ask you to derive equations. Okay, any questions about this or the derivation of the equation? Okay, so if you look at so the last thing we'll do for this part is we'll look at bundled conductors. Okay, because bundled conductors happen quite often in practice, right? We said I bought them right away. I'm gonna put lots of conductors together. I'm gonna put lots of them right next to each other. So what you see is if you zoom in, this is actually all carrying the same phase here. Right, they're all carrying, they're basically four parallel lines, right? So they're basically four parallel lines, all carrying the same phase. So there's a lot of, this is called a bundling of conductors. As effectively, I have three conductors. I have three conductors, I have, in this case, I have four, I have four circuits, all close to each other. And this changes the inductance calculations a little bit. Okay, this changes the a little bit. And uh, this is done because bundling conductors has zero advantages, right? We bundle things. Basically, the surface 
it reduces the uh, surface of the conductor, reduces the electric field, it reduces inductance, and uh, sort of it's cooled better. Right? So there's reasons we'll bundle them. But to do calculations, turns out the equations doesn't change very much. Okay, the equations doesn't change very much because we'll make a lot of assumptions. So let's say we have A, B, C phase being carried by a bundle of conductors. Then we'll make a lot of assumptions. We'll basically assume that everything has the same radius R. So these are the identical wires we're using, identical conductors we're using. We'll assume that within a bundle, within a bundle, it's carrying, you know, the distance is much less than the distance separating each bundle. And it is separating them. And we're going to assume basically everything is symmetry. Okay, we'll assume every uh, symmetrical things. And turns out the equation becomes a ball. It turns out the equation becomes a ball. We have a single conductor. This is L mu zero over two pi log of D over R prime, right? This is the calculation we did. Then for a bundle conductors, all we do is we change the radius of the conductor. What we have is log mu zero over two pi, not log. This inductance is L equals the natural log of D over RB. Okay, RB is you can think of as the effective radius of how big this bundle is. And this effective radius, capital RB, this turns out to be the geometric mean. Okay, this turns out to be the geometric mean of the following numbers. R prime, D12, D13, D14. And you take a power of one fourth. So what that means is this, right? So if you look at within a bundle, inside this is R, and this is D12, D14, D13. Okay. So this is as effectively, this whole thing looks like a conductor with the effective radius RB. Okay, so this is just what the equations come out to be. As you have this sort of smaller bundles, you draw a, you know, draw a box, you put a box around them, ask what is the effective value, effective radius, this becomes the effective radius. It's the geometric mean. It's the geometric mean of all the radiuses we have. Again, why is it this? Well, you know, you need to do some work to figure out why this is the case. But the nice thing about this is if you look at this effective radius, this normally is much larger than R prime. Okay? Because this is a, a mean in some sense of all the distances we have. And normally the separation within a bundle is much larger than the radius of a conductor in the bundle. Okay, so this looks like a bigger, much bigger conductor, even though we did not use a bigger conductor, we use a bundle of smaller conductors. Okay, so you know, just remember ge geometric mean. This. So you have never seen geometric mean before. Well, geometric mean is you know, just define this way. Okay, geometric mean is defined this way. You multiply these distances. You take a root that corresponds to how many things you're multiplying. If you only have one cable, one conductor, then this is just R prime by itself. And the inductance is L mu zero over two pi, natural log of D over RB. 
It's just a geometric mean. So this is some, so geometric mean, the name comes because this is somewhat similar to arithmetic mean, except you're taking the average of the log. Okay, so you can think of it that way. Okay, so if you had never heard of geometric mean, uh, just remember this is a formula. Okay, this formula comes out to be like something like this. Any questions for this? So I know this is, you know, some equations without much derivation, but uh, at least, you know, we should remember sort of intuitively, right, intuitively where these numbers come from, right? So, and why we construct the, the, the lines the way we do. Right? So this gives, you know, one reason why we bundle. Right? Because effectively it's a bigger wire, okay? That's a bigger wire. So let's do some examples before the end of class. So, right, so let's do see some numbers for this, right? So let's say we have three conductors, each have a radius of two centimeters. They're all separate out by you know, 50 centimeters. Then what is the RB, right? What is RB? Well, so putting some numbers to this, we have, First, we need to compute R prime. Okay, this is R times E to the minus 104. So we always have to do this. Turns out this constant always shows up in all these calculations. So this is two times E to the minus 104. This is 1.56 centimeters. And then RB is the geometric mean of all these things. So this is R prime. D12, D13, one third. Okay, so we're multiplying three things together. So we take a you know cube root. You plug this in, this becomes 15.7 centimeters. So there's just one example of a calculation we can do. Okay, so this is straightforward. Right. This is a triangle, straightforward. So let's look at a slightly harder question, slightly harder question. So now let's say I have a rect I have a square. Okay. So let's ask again, what is R prime? What is R B? Right? And uh, you know, I look at the ratio of the inductance when I use a single conductor versus the inductance when I use a bundle. Okay, so we want to look at, you know, if by bundling, how much do I improve? Right? How much do I reduce the inductance? Okay. So R prime is exactly the same calculation we did before, right? We just compute this, this is 1.56 centimeters. Okay. RB, is R prime D12, D13, D14, the power one fourth. Okay. So R prime is 1.56 times 50 times 50. What is the next distance we should use if this is a square? Okay, so the so if you do this question very fast, you're tempted to also write 50 here, right? That's not correct, right? So this is 50 root two, right? So the thing is because we're looking at this distance, okay? we're looking at this distance. So this distance is 50 root two okay? centimeters, not 50. Okay? So this is 50 times root two, one fourth, we get 22.9 centimeters. So L single divided by the bundle. Yeah, so we, they all have a mu naught over two pi log of B over R prime. Mu naught over two pi log of B over R B. Right, so then this, so things cancel. This is log over D over R prime, log of
Sorry, I forgot to give you D, okay, RB. Yeah, I forgot to give you D, sorry about this. So if we're given D, we can plug this in on computer's number. Okay, so given D, we can compute this, forgot to give you D here. So uh, if once we know D, we can compute this number to figure out what the ratio is. So the last thing we'll do in this class is basically what we have is for in practice is if they're symmetrical, right? We often, often want things to be symmetrical. Okay, we all, always want things to be symmetrical. Okay. However, if you arrange things in a bundle, they don't always appear to be symmetrical, right? Because if you arrange things to be flat, like this, if this face A, face B, face C, if they're flat like this, there's some asymmetry around this, right? Because they're not all at the same position with respect to the ground, for example. Okay, so they're not always the same position with respect to ground. So what often we want to do is we want to make this more symmetrical. Okay? So we often want to make this more symmetrical. So what we tend to do is the following thing. We tend to do the following thing with three faces. So when we have three phase, this is A, B, and C. If they appear to be, if they appear to be, so if they, they first appear to be like this, what we do is we'll something called transpose transmission line. Basically, we'll switch them around such that A is not always far too far from C. Right? If they start with this kind of arrangement, A is close to B, B is close to C, but C is far away from A. So what we do is we often transpose this, okay? So we'll physically make the wire, A wire go here. This is A. So let me draw different face with different colors. B face will come here, go up, B goes down. B will come here, go down, come here, and go up. Okay, so this is B phase. This is C phase. Here, go up, come here, go down, like this. Okay, so this is called transposition. The reason is we want all the wires to be equally far apart from each other on average. Okay, so if we don't transpose them, you know, some A may be always be far away from C, which destroys the symmetry we have in the system. So for symmetry reasons, we do transposing. Okay, for symmetry reasons, we do transposing. And the good thing is, then the inductance for all phases, right? So then basically, they all look the same because everything is symmetrical, okay? everything is symmetrical. Then this is mu zero over two pi log of dm over rb. And dm is the geometric mean of how far the conductors are. Okay, so this is d12, d23, d13. Okay, so that would be just how far, the, uh, how far the wires are. So we take a lot of effort to make sure everything is symmetrical to each other. Okay, this will do. And uh, you see this a lot, right? So you see this in practice. So if you go out and look at a transmission tower carefully, you'll see this kind of transposition, right? One wire, one face will come in, gets shifted. So that's the right line. Then the yellow and the green, the positions all change to make sure things are symmetrical over an average. So we don't distinguish the phase from each other, right? So, so it's not like A phase impact plus B phase different than the C phase, okay? So this is for symmetry. And they all look, you know, we can get a some balance three phase and things are, you know, we can, we can just analyze a single phase equal to the circuit, okay? Uh, what's the DM, Professor, can go back to the slide? Sure. 
So M is the distance they have. So M is distance they have. So they're sort of how far away they're from each other. And then if you transpose like this, then we can assume everything is roughly equal distance. So this will be more clear if we do an example. Okay, this is the values, where the values come from, will come from, will be more clear once we do an example. So the photo three face like the yeah. triangle, so all the D the same distance, so we can just assume it's just a D. Yeah, so for the triangle, it'd be the same distance. So what this does is also for the triangle, right? So three phase triangle. Yes. Yeah, so we need to switch the order of the three phase, right? So transfer yes. thing, we need to switch the order of these things. We often need to switch the order of these things. What do you mean by switch the order? So what you see is you see a lot of lines. Okay, so when you see a lot of lines, uh, if you look at this lines, it's not exact triangle because they're carrying three wires roughly on the same plane to each other, roughly on the same plane. And also, even if they're carrying a triangle, they're not symmetric to everything around them. Right, so I can oh, yeah. carry them in a triangle. A may be a little bit higher up to ground than everything else. Okay. Okay. There's some asymmetry, even if they're from them three, they appear symmetrical. So when you switch the order, it's basically you switch the order of the face around. You basically, you know, at each tower, you change how the face is connected, something like this. Oh yes. So they appear yeah. to be more symmetrical over a long run, over the average of the long run. So we, okay. there's a, yeah, we spend a lot of effort making sure three facing are balanced three face. This is one example of that. Okay, so we'll end the class here today. Okay, so uh, reminder again, homework two due tonight. Uh, new homework will be posted early next morning. So the goal is we'll do more calculations with transmission lines, but not so, not too much more. Okay, so we'll look at some more equations. We'll look at some, you know, calculating the conductances, calculating the capacitances. Then we'll go to transmission line models. And after that, we'll arrive at the point where we can do circuit analysis. All right, so we'll probably have a midterm, uh, maybe three weeks from now, roughly, three weeks from now, okay? Now the quarter is not that long. So, have a midterm, you know, roughly in the middle, then we'll have a final at the end. So if you know you're traveling or you know you have conflict, please let me know. Okay. I'll, I'll have a uh, more concrete date by next Monday of midterm. But if you know you have a mid, you know, if you know of conflicts, let me know. Okay. Right. If you know, if you need sort of special arrangement for taking this remote midterm, also let me know. Right. So, you know, just communicate with me. There's, we already have people taking midterm at different times. We have people in Asia taking midterm at different times. So it's not that much trouble if you need to take at different time, but do let me know if there's something you need. All right, so other than that, uh, I'll see you next week, see you next Monday.